Good evening, everyone. My name is Ware Harmon, and I'm the Executive Director of Town Hall Seattle. On behalf of our organization, uh, PCC Markets and Third Place Books, it's a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's appearance by Marian Nessel. As we get underway, I want to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. And we thank you all for tuning in on this Friday night. Town Hall is sincerely grateful for the opportunity to uh, invite Seattle audiences and beyond into present tense exchanges of issues, ideas, and creativity, even when we don't get to do it in person. Town Hall will continue to produce online content throughout this fall and into the new year, and as circumstances allow to even host live streams from our building. Meanwhile, if like me, you just can't seem to log quite enough hours on Zoom or YouTube, know that many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form under the header digital media on our homepage. Back to tonight's event. Marion will speak for about 40 minutes, after which she'll take uh, questions from the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. Please keep your own question concise, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, also know that you can view the event both here on Crowdcast or over on our YouTube page if you want to utilize that platform's closed captioning feature. Town Hall's adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming uh, appearances include um, Mario Livio, Michael Eric Dyson in conversation with Robin D'Angelo, Roger Rosenblatt, Robert Putnam, Andre Gregory, a pair of programs from the 20 year, uh, 2020, I should say, Earshot Jazz Festival, and a virtual edition of the Bushwick Book Club, this time featuring all new songs inspired by Eric Liu's Becoming, um, Become America. Sorry. Both of these last two programs are actually offered live from our forum space. And for more information about all of the above, visit townhallseattle.org. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Uh, our Arno Matulski Science Lecture Series honors the distinguished UW professor of genomics and is supported by Microsoft, KUOW, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. But as most of you watching tonight likely know, Town Hall is at heart a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members watching. We truly wouldn't be us without your support. And one last piece of infomercial. It goes without saying that our partner booksellers are feeling the effects of the pandemic as well. Since you'll want to go deeper into the issues presented in tonight's book, tonight's discussion, I should say, um, I hope you'll consider purchasing your copy of the book here tonight from our partners at Third Place Books. More than ever, it's important to keep it local. All right. Mary Nessel is the Paulette Goddard Professor of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health Emerita at New York University. Her research examines scientific and socioeconomic influences on food choice, obesity, and food safety, with an emphasis on the role of industrial food and its influence on the American diet. Nestle has won too many awards to mention, but we can start with another category, name checks by town hall regulars. Michael Pollan ranked her as the number two most important foodie in America. She was bumped from the number one, number one slot by Michelle Obama. And Mark Bittman ranked her number one in his list of foodies to be thankful for in 2019. She's the author of, a six, uh, of six prize-winning books, including Food Politics, How the Food Industry Influences Nutrition and Health, uh, published in 2002, Soda Politics, Taking on Big Soda and Winning, published in 2015, and 2018's Unsavory Truth, How Food Companies Skew the Science of What We Eat. Both of those last two books were the occasions of her visits to Town Hall Seattle and her latest book, Let's ask Marion what you need to know about the politics of food, food, nutrition, and health is the subject of her visit tonight, at least her virtual visit. Please join me in welcoming back Marion Nessel. Oh, thanks so much for the introduction. And I'm just so sorry that I'm not there in person. I was so looking forward to going to Seattle again and this has to be virtual. Um, so I've got slides that I'm going to be showing if I can figure out how to do it. And the, the um, uh, as soon as I can do that, then I think we're on. Great. Um, I hope everybody can see that. And um, if there's a problem with it, someone will let me know. Uh, but uh, this is by way of introduction. I write books about food politics. I'm really interested in the politics of food. I think it's something really fun and interesting to talk about. And the my latest book, uh, which came out on September 1st, is called Let's Ask Marion What You Need to Know About the Politics of Food, Nutrition, and Health. And it is a conversation with a friend of mine named Carrie Truman. Uh, this is a really unusual book in my life 
collection. For one thing, it's tiny. It's an absolutely minute book. It's four inches by six inches, not much bigger than a cup. And it's a very short summary of my ideas about food systems and food politics. And I've written it for a very general audience. Anybody can read it, including the three-year-old daughter of my editor. Uh, the uh, the book I, I wrote the book with Carrie Truman and Carrie Truman uh, about ten years ago wrote a blog called Eating Liberally and every now and then she would shoot me an extremely well informed and witty question um, and her questions were usually 150 to 200 words and then I would write five to 500 to a thousand word responses and she would post them on her website under the title, Let's Ask Marion. So that's where the title came from. And when University of California Press asked me to do a book that would summarize my thinking about these issues, I thought of Carrie <clears throat> and Carrie agreed to write the questions. Um, and then that made it just ever so much easier for me to do the uh, responses and the essays. And we decided that we would discuss uh, the questions that we get asked most often, the, the kinds of things that everybody is just always asking me. And we divided them up into three categories, uh, the politics of personal diets, the community politics of food choice and the global politics of diet, health and the environment. Um, and I wrote an introduction that lays out the issues uh, and the themes that go through all of these questions. And I wrote a concluding section that's about food advocacy because I'm really interested in food advocacy. I think we need it badly. Uh, now we finished writing the book. Uh, before the coronavirus uh, pandemic hit. And in fact, I was reading the page proofs for the book in April this year. And fortunately, I was thinking, oh, this book really needs to talk about COVID-19. And fortunately, there was one page, um, a blank page after the introduction, and I got to add something about it, um, in, in which I could say that the pandemic has devastated livelihoods, lives, and economies, and has exposed the contradictions and inequities of profit-driven economic health care and food systems. Um, and those are the themes of Let's Ask Marion. Uh, one major theme is that the food system is flawed. Another is that food is political. And another is that advocacy is absolutely critical if we're going to get the kind of food system that we need. Um, and the other thing that's sort of interesting about this is that I was asked this summer to teach a course at New York University um, on anything I wanted. And I picked food politics in the coronavirus era. And I'm using Let's Ask Marion as a textbook in that class um, because it was as if the book was designed for a class that I hadn't taught yet. It just turned out to be perfect for the class. And the students said they liked it for one thing. It's short. Um, but I think the coronavirus impact is really worth talking about. And that's really what I want to talk about um, tonight. And um, because the coronavirus pandemic revealed major flaws in the food system. It revealed how important diet is to health. It revealed how important social, social determinants are for the health um, and well-being and food security of people in the United States and elsewhere. It revealed the plight of low-wage workers who are often ignored. Um, and nobody pays any attention to them. It made corporate capture of government very clear. It made the politics of hunger quite clear. And it established a really strong agenda for food advocacy. So I thought that's what I would talk about um, briefly tonight, starting with 
the very beginning of the pandemic when the first thing that happened was there wasn't any food on grocery store shelves. And this was kind of amazing because we produce twice the amount of food in the United States as the population needs. How come the shelves were empty? So well, the first revelation was that we have two completely separate food supply chains, one for retail stores, grocery stores, and convenience stores, and the other for food service. When restaurants closed and schools closed and institutions closed, those two supply chains were so far apart and so inflexible that there was no way that the food service supply chain could provide food for the retail stores. The packaging was wrong. They just couldn't do it. And we were in big trouble. Um, the next revelation had to do with who suffered most from uh, the coronavirus and the bad effects of the coronavirus. And it was people with high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, all of which are conditions that are greatly affected by what we eat. So that was another lesson learned from COVID-19. A third was how important the social determinants of health are. Uh, the people who were most at risk for these chronic diseases and most at risk for obesity and therefore most at risk for severe outcomes of COVID-19 were are people who suffer from racial and ethnic dis discrimination, don't have access to healthy food or health care, um, live in physical environments that are unhealthy, lots of toxins in the air, uh, lots of pollution, are of low socioeconomic status, don't have much money or education, um, and are in uh, social and community contexts that don't uh, promote their health. This also became very obvious. And uh, for people who didn't know about these things, they were in the newspapers, the press, and on television all the time. Um, one of the great contradictions exposed by the pandemic was that we were destroying food, massive amounts of food, at a time when people who didn't have any money to buy food were lined up for miles in automobiles at food banks to be given handouts of food. And a contradiction that we hadn't seen in America since the Great Depression of the 1930s. We're seeing now the return of the bread line. And as this one article talked about, in the 1930s, Americans lined up on sidewalks waiting for food and today they're lining up on the roads, but it's still bread lines. Um, and it's still an astonishing thing to see in a country which, with as much money as we have in this country. And then as part of the destruction of food, we were destroying animals and not destroying them in particularly gentle or kind ways. They were just being thrown away because there was no place for them to go to be slaughtered. And this had to do with the disruption of the nation's food chain because of the crowded conditions in meatpacking plants. Meatpacking workers were getting sick and public health authorities wanted to shut down the meatpacking plants and did shut them down uh, in order to protect the workers and send them home and keep them away from each other so the virus wouldn't spread. This had, um, a clogging effect that caused the producers not to have any place to send their animals, again, because we have a very industrialized um, animal food chain that doesn't allow any kind of flexibility. And then meat didn't get into retail stores and people couldn't buy the meat that they were used to getting. And the um, uh, in the rush to maintain the meat supply, the meat industry was very upset about this. Um, the plants became COVID-19 hotspots. They became focal areas and lots and lots of people in those plants got sick. Um, no government agency seems to be tracking illnesses among meatpacking workers, but Leah Douglas, who's a writer for the Food and Environment Reporting Network, has been doing a fantastic job 
of keeping score. She has her sources and she's adding them up. Um, these are probably minimal figures. These are confirmed cases. There have been nearly 72,000 among meatpacking farm and food processing workers, most of them in the meatpacking area. And there have been 327 deaths. And those are just the confirmed cases and deaths. There are probably many, many more of them. Um, and this is because of the conditions in the slaughterhouses where workers are right on top of each other. They're not wearing masks, or they didn't used to wear masks. Um, they weren't required to, to wear masks. Uh, they weren't required to keep six feet apart. They were just on top of each other, uh, dealing with the meat that was coming through at very high speeds, um, as Eric Schlosser wrote about in The Atlantic. Uh, Leah Douglas also keeps track of where this is happening and it's happening in big meat. Uh, the, three the three companies with the most cases are Tyson Foods, Smithfield, and JBS. JBS is a Brazilian company. Smithfield is now owned by China. Um, but these are big meat in every sense of the word because the meat industry is extremely concentrated, meaning that it has a lot of power. Four meat companies own 80% of the processing of all U.S. cattle, and four meat companies own 66% of all um, hogs and all pigs in the, and hogs in the United States. Um, these are very highly concentrated industries, meaning that they have a lot of political power um, and uh, and are just enormously powerful in every possible way. I've given here the, uh, the 2019 revenues from these companies, Cargill, $114 billion. That's not, that's revenues, not just meat, it's on everything that Cargill produces. JBS, 50 billion, Tyson, 42 billion, Smithfield, a much smaller company, 14 billion. But these are very, very large companies. Um, with a lot of power. And their power was expressed in, in very obvious ways. On the same day that the Washington Post had an article about how w workers in meatpacking plants were complaining that they were being pushed by their bosses to show up while they were sick, being penalized if they went home, um, and absolutely forbidden to wear masks. Tyson uh, had a full page ad in the newspaper um, complaining about how they were being forced by these nasty public health authorities to shut their doors. And if they had to do that, then you wouldn't get the meat that you deserve or they would just disappear, disappear from the supply chain. Um, and in fact, the president invoked the Defense Production Act not to force the meat companies to treat their workers with respect and save them from this virus, but to force the meat plants to stay open. Um, and we now know how that happened because ProPublica and Public Citizen both used the Freedom of Information Act to get emails, and they have emails that demonstrate that the meatpacking industry essentially wrote the president's defense order um, and handed it to him to put out, and that the meatpacking industry collaborated with the USDA in order to undermine any kind of response to COVID because they didn't want to slow down uh, the meat processing. Uh, Senators Warren and Booker did an investigation into the meatpackers' manipulation of this crisis um, and discovered that the companies had manipulated the, the coronavirus crisis in order to achieve deregulatory measures that placed the workers at even greater risk, like they increased line speeds. Um, so a lot of what was going on behind the scenes is coming out. Now, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention issued a report in which they have this nice graphic about what meat companies were supposed to do in order to slow the spread of COVID-19. And they called for screening workers for symptoms, increasing space between workers, 
enhancing cleaning and disinfection and providing um, multilingual training, which is a really good idea. Uh, but this didn't really happen. And in fact, um, more emails obtained by ProPublica found that the meat com packing companies were fighting the health agencies over the outbreaks in the plant. They weren't working with them to try to keep the workers safe. And that in fact, the CDC had softened its report on meat packing safety, making very gentle suggestions that it would be really nice if the meat companies tried to protect their workers a little bit, but with no teeth and no, uh, you know, with and no mandate to do anything. And as the coronavirus just caused more and more damage in the meatpacking industries, minorities bore the brunt of it because a lot of the workers in meatpacking plants are immigrants or minorities of one kind or another. And they're, some of them are unionized and the union said that this was a violation of the Civil Rights Act and they filed complaints against Tyson and JBS over the failures to obey the, the CDC uh, guidelines for keeping the workers safe, um, the meat industry did everything that it could to stop these lawsuits. And the occupational, the occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is the agency that's supposed to protect worker safety, actually pressed the court to get rid of the union's complaints against the meat packer. Um, so we have a situation here in which uh, the government, the government agencies and the industry were closely collaborating to keep the meat plants open at any cost. Now, um, OSHA did find, they did find that JBS uh, and, Con and ConAgra were guilty of making the workers work too close together. And the total fine for each of them was $13,494, uh, not even $15,000 for all of these people who are getting sick. And there was a one beef plant in Iowa, in Iowa that got fined $957, a little slap on the wrist. Um, the meat packers have been denying workers benefits. If the workers were trying to get um, health care benefits or unemployment insurance or protection for the time they were sick, the meat packing companies were fighting against that. And the Trump administration um, had decided that it was going to um, revise a um, labor survey and not conduct this survey. It would suspend its data collection. And fortunately, a federal judge just today overturned that and said that the data would still be collected. Um, and here that is. They have, uh, they ordered the Trump administration to reinstate the farm worker wage survey. Um, so that's the situation with meat packers, you know, which is kind of amazing. And we would never have known about that situation had this not happened. Um, and I'd like to turn now to what's going on on the uh, hunger front, on the long lines waiting for food handouts at food banks. Um, here, uh, there are you know, millions and millions of Americans are reporting that they don't have enough food. Again, there are sharp, there are very sharp racial disparities among this, um, and there are just loads and loads of people in America who are worried about where their next meal is going to be coming from, and that's no surprise because millions and millions of people are, uh, have lost their jobs um, and are out of work. And the number of people applying for new, these are all initial claims for unemployment compensation. They peaked in March. Uh, but they and, and then went down, but there's still a million or more people uh, every week who are applying for unemployment insurance. And it's very difficult to get uh, clear data on how many millions of Americans are unemployed. Uh, the current figure that I've seen is 22 million, but this is just the people who are on unemployment insurance. 
Uh, what about all the people who are unemployed and are not getting unemployment insurance because they've used up their benefits or because they made so little money ahead of ahead of time that they don't qualify for it. Um, so it's not surprising that food insecurity became a problem. And um, in July, 40 percent of mothers with children in the United States said that they were worried about where the next meal was going to be coming from 35% of US households with children under the age of 18 and almost a quarter of all United States households said that they were worried about food insecurity. Um, so where is SNAP in all this? SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly food stamps, um, is the program that uh, the last remaining vestige of the food safety net and um, clearly the program that is most functional doing all of this. Uh, why isn't SNAP doing more? A really good question. Um, well, SNAP is an entitlement and anybody who is entitled makes a, meets the criteria for eligibility is entitled to get SNAP benefits. And there has been an increase of 6 million people enrolled in the program uh, since February. So booming enrollments in just about every state, that's what's shown here, are the state figures. And in almost every state, there's been an increased enrollment. Um, and that is rather ironic because the Trump administration has from the very beginning gone to great efforts to try to reduce SNAP enrollments um, and through three methods. Um, SNAP recipients are obliged by law to work, but those work requirements are waived in states that in wh where they, uh, the state officials believe that there aren't jobs available for people in the income bracket that are qualified, that are, that qualifies for SNAP. Um, and so the Trump administration um, has made great efforts to try to get rid of the waivers. Um, a second method was to introduce the public charge rule, which says that anybody who is not a citizen who uh, gets public benefits may not be eligible for citizenship and may be eligible for deportation. And then the third was to substitute food boxes for um, the electronic benefit cards that SNAP recipients can take to grocery stores. So let me say just a little bit about each of what's happened to that. Um, on the uh, food stamp work rules, they backed off on it. There was an enormous amount of pressure. There's obviously not jobs for people. Lots of people are out of work. So the Trump administration backed off on that. Um, but once the national emergency is declared over, uh, that I'm sure that stipulation will come back. Uh, for immigrants who had a really difficult choice between not getting food stamps or um, you know, not getting food stamps or risking deportation, they got a reprieve also because a federal judge blocked the administration from implementing the public charge rule during the pandemic. But we don't know how long that's going to last. And on the food boxes, um, the food boxes were something that, that Sonny Perdue, who's the Secretary of Agriculture, proposed in February 2018. And it was immediately greeted with appalled responses and the New York Times headline about it, plan unliked and unlikely will replace food, some food stamps with boxes of foods. And uh, everybody complained that there were no details, the logistics were unclear and likely to be very complicated. People wouldn't have any choice about what they were being given. And this would end up being welfare for agribusiness. Well, that was two years ago and it kind of got dropped. But the coronavirus gave the Department of Agriculture the opportunity to bring back this program. And it did to uh, initially with a $3 billion um, allocation. And it was called Farmers to Families. And the way that it was would work would be that distributors would pick up food from farmers who had no outlet to sell their products. 
and then would deliver it to food banks, private food banks, to distribute it to families, um, shoring up the private voluntary food distribution system rather than trying to do something to strengthen SNAP. Um, so the uh, $3 billion program began in May um, and we're now on the fourth round of contracts and about four and a half billion dollars has been allocated to this program so far. Uh, the program has come under a great deal of criticism um, I, about what's in the boxes, how the boxes are being delivered. Um, I've asked everybody who's in the business to send me photographs of what these boxes look like. And, and somebody sent, one, sent me, this one looks great. Um, it's got a lot of veg. This was the vegetable box. There's also a dairy box and a meat box. Um, and I think it looks great. Um, and it must be really nice for people to be getting these things. Um, Trump required that the boxes come with a letter from him. Uh, that was kind of interesting. And the food banks have been very embarrassed about this and have been taking them out. Um, and an article in today's Politico uh, talked about how the food bank people see this as election um, propaganda and they're very worried about it. They don't want to be in the position of getting caught as having a particular electoral view. And a lot of food banks have been pulling out the letters. Um, their complaints that the food box overpaid and under delivered um, that and the overpayment is pretty clear. The estimated price for what goes into the veg the fruit and vegetable boxes was under $10, but the Department of Agriculture is paying the distributors $23.50 per box. Um, so there's um, the distributors are doing really well um, on this program. And the counter, which has been following this program very closely, has had a number of articles about it, about who is profiting from it, that the contractors who are doing the distributors are getting, making really a lot of money. And the as the program, uh, the third part of the program was winding down, the farmers are complaining that small farmers are not getting um, paid for this, the money is going to industrial agriculture and to major uh, big suppliers. So the original intent of the program was to help small and medium farmers is not doing that. But the real problem with the food boxes is it's free produce with a side of shaming. Instead of beefing up the SNAP program, the government went back to depression era food lines, um, which are uncomfortable, difficult, bad for the individuals who are getting the program, bad for the food banks, even though uh, I'm sure people are really happy to be getting the food. Uh, so I want to close with asking, you know, this is all very depressing. And I want to close by asking if anything good could come out of this. And I actually think that there are very good things that are coming out of this or can be coming out of this. Um, for one thing, there's some evidence that COVID is making people healthier. It's inspiring more people to cook at home. It's um, in the beginning of the pandemic, you couldn't buy seeds at stores that sold them because everybody was growing vegetables, um, planting more vegetable gardens. And then at the end of the summer, certainly in upstate New York, uh, where I am, there was a run on canning jars and you can't buy canning jars uh, for dealing with the produce that's in gardens. So that's kind of nice. I think that's great. Um, another one has to do with schools. Um, one of the great revelations of the pandemic was that schools are not just about teaching kids, they're about feeding kids as well. And that if schools weren't in, se in session, kids weren't going to be fed. And so there was a big hoopla about what to do about school breakfasts and lunches. And the schools ended up providing them to people in the community. Um, and they provided them free. So for the first time, we had universal school meals that were uh, given to children who were in school, out of school, and to their families and communities. Uh, the USDA objected rather strenuously to this and really did everything it could to end this. 
um, and this was in August, but there was so much uh, opposition to ending the free school meals that the Department of Agriculture extended them through December 31st. And more recently, the program has been extended through uh, June 30th. So we've got, uh, during this year, universal school meals, something that nutrition advocates and food advocates have been advocating for for decades. Um, should all American kids get a free lunch? Yes the pandemic might make it a reality, that would be absolutely terrific. So that would be a good that might come out of this. And then the idea that the low wage workers, the delivery people at grocery stores, the meat packing workers, farm workers, um, when restaurants come back, restaurant workers who are not covered by worker protection laws the way other workers are covered. Uh, that's something that a lot of people didn't know about. Now many, many more people know about that and I think that's a good thing too. Um, Francis Moore Lappe, the author of Diet for a Small Planet, wrote a terrific article in the Boston Globe recently saying that if we want to fix our food system, we have to fix our democracy. And that the reason people are hungry is not from lack of food, but because they don't have political power. So the real job that we have to do is to get political power for food advocates. Uh, this is what democracy is about. Um, this is what food democracy is about. Um, and it's um, what I think we all need to be advocating for. And fortunately, we have an opportunity to do something right now. If you don't know what to do, I've got an easy answer for it. Vote on Tuesday. Um, I'm always arguing that individuals should vote with your fork for the kind of um, food system that you want, and that individual choices are very important in um, keeping farmers working well and buying farmers' products and supporting organic foods and supporting regenerative agriculture and all of those good things. Uh, but right now, it's really important that you vote with your vote. So I hope you'll do that. And thanks very much for letting me talk about these things. Um, and these are the kinds of things I talk about in Let's Ask Marion. So thanks so much for letting me be here. And I'll get rid of that. Uh, Thank you, Marion. While uh, folks are putting their own questions in, and I'm personally, without you know overly politicizing tonight's conversation, I would be curious to hear your thoughts about anything um, that say the Biden-Harris team has uh, proposed in any position statements, but I'll, I'll let somebody else put a um, put that question into the chat. I have a couple of things I just wanted to follow up on, things that you talked about at the very, very end um, of your presentation. Um, it is heartening that this could end up being um, uh, an event that breaks the dam around, uh, around a distribution through schools and sort of getting uh, universal student lunches sort of... Uh, into the system. Do we have any data uh, at this point about any loss uh, about uh, families and children in particular who aren't being served um, specifically? Like, in other words, it can't be a one to one replacement of children who used to previously be on free and reduced lunch who are still able to access food. Or, or are we finding that that really there's that much of, of, of an uptake of these kinds of, of, of programs that have sprung up during the pandemic? Well, I think it depends completely on where you are. Um, there are some programs that are doing a much better job of meeting the needs of people in the community than others. But I think the you know number of people who are at risk now and who aren't getting food, uh, who are out of work, um, I don't know how they're paying their rent um, or or doing that. I, you know, I, it's uh, for people who aren't in that position. If you're not in the middle of it, you're not seeing it. But for people who are on the front lines, they just can't believe how tough it is for people these days. So anything that can be done yeah. to help families meet their food needs, it seems to me, is a really good thing to do right now. It strikes me too that um, although it it is an intrinsic good, at the same time we're asking we're asking the schools to be a conduit to healthy nutrition. It's analogous to the way we ask libraries to step into the breach of providing housing and providing other services 
that other dimensions of our government can't seem to manage the delivery to different populations. And this just seems like yet another example of, of uh, foisting a responsibility onto a system that's designed initially to do something else. And we're glad that they're there to sort of fill the breach, but um, wish we could solve it. We really wish we had, we really wish we had a functional government. Right, then there's that. Um, the, uh, the other question just uh, that popped to my mind is, um, around your remarks around uh, essential workers and 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 the, and whether that you you whether you imagine there are any potential um, uh, upsides for grocery workers, uh, uh, restaurant workers, other you know other workers who came to be deemed as essential during this time, um, but uh, and have been at risk and have you know obviously put themselves at risk to do these jobs at this time, um, but. Previously, were I would say among societies less well compensated, less well regarded. Like, do you imagine what are some of the other kinds of uh, legacies in terms of both the dignity and the compensation and the sort of uh, support that those um, that folks doing that work might be able to expect uh, in the future as a result of this time? Expect? I think it depends completely on uh, public demand and on what the government is willing to do. I mean, we need a decent minimum wage that covers all of these people. Um, they need health care. They need education. I mean, they need what uh, everybody in society ought to be able to have access to. Right. Whether they'll be able to get it depends a lot on what happens and whether there's public demand for it. And I would say that unionization would be another a uh, really big issue. The um, I'm sort of interested that the Meatpacking Workers Union um, represents quite a number of meat packers. But if you go to their website, they talk about what a weak union they are hmm. and the reasons for why they're so weak. That the laws that have been passed over the last 40, 50 years um, are continually making it impossible for them to represent uh, the people who um, are in their union the way they ought to be representing. I, they ought to be screaming bloody murder over these things. And yeah. you don't hear much about them. Yeah. I mean, they are filing lawsuits. Um, so that's a start. I am going to pivot to questions that are now coming in Fast and Furious. So, uh, and without, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be more organized going forward, but I'll just start at the very top. Do you think it's ever appropriate or productive for nonprofits with food systems focused to partner with industry? Uh, I'll rephrase that so maybe it makes more sense. Is it ever appropriate um, or productive for nonprofits with food systems focused to partner with industry? Well, they are. I mean, they already are. Um, you know, I think it depends completely on the situation. I'm in a very privileged position. I don't have to take industry money. And it's very difficult for me to... Um, I mean, I wrote a book, The Unsavory Truth, about food industry funding of research. And I don't think that researchers should take industry money, uh, especially industry money that's aimed at marketing. Um, but, uh, you know, and for nonprofits, the, uh, it depends on how the money is given and what it does. I've always been very concerned about anti-hunger organizations who take food industry money and then are in a position of not being able to lobby for healthy food for the people who are receiving the food that they're giving out because the companies that are supporting them make ultra processed junk foods right. um, or sodas or whatever. So they don't join anti-soda campaigns. Uh, they really can't do that if they get money from the soda industry, it puts them in a very compromised position. Um, so I suppose it depends on which food industry is supporting you. Um, these things are complicated. So the next question that was upvoted, and for, they're, for, fortunately, they're all disparate, so I can just sort of take them as they come. Sheila's <laughs> question is, do you think we can get rid of industrial farming? I dislike the cruelty to the animals, plus this type of farming is causing great harm to everyone. Yeah, I mean, I just, it's funny, I just finished watching a whole set of videos from Arizona State University on um, regenerative meat raising, and it's a beautiful thing to watch. Mm. Uh, 
you know, I mean, and yes, can regenerative agriculture feed the world? I think it can. I think we need a lot more of it. Um, and if we're going to, you know, I think agricultural policy needs to be linked to health policy. Um, and if we're going to have a decent agricultural policy, then it has to be promoting health and promoting sustainability and climate friendly and all of those things. And yes, we could do it. It means food would be more expensive, but that means government has to do a different kind of subsidizing. Right. Um, uh, related question from Maria. Uh, what are your thoughts on the politics, health and nutrition of the carnivore diet generally? Well, I'm an omnivore um, and I'm, you know, for, for me, uh, the basic uh, advice about healthy diets for a healthy planet is to eat less meat. Less doesn't necessarily mean none, but it sure means a lot less than what we're currently eating. Um, you know, I don't know. There are different ways of arguing about it. I think you can argue that we evolved to eat meat. You know, our digestive system is set up for it. Um, but we sure could do a lot better job of producing meat. Um, we could do it in a much healthier and more environmentally friendly way, and we could do it in a way that's better for the animals and better for the people who are raising them. But not everybody agrees. Um, I'm almost a vegetarian, but not quite. <laughs> uh, Christina asks uh, that you mentioned having food provided for every child in school free of charge, but how could this work in practice? Would the idea be for all public schools to have buffet style food catered to different dietary restrictions? How could this account for cuisine differences between children and what they've grown up eating at home? Oh, the school food business. It's really, I mean, it's what I've seen of school food is that the Department of Agriculture has regulations about the nutritional quality of the food that's being served and what kinds of things need to be served. But what that food looks like in the school, what it tastes like, what it smells like, what it looks like is absolutely dependent on who the people are who are running the program in individual schools. Um, and that's also true of, about whether the kids are eating it or not. And there are two issues involved. What is the quality of the food and what is, and whether the kids are eating it or not. And those are two completely separate things. And I've been in schools where the food is great and the kids are eating it. I've been in schools where the food is, you know, okay, the kids are eating it, and the opposite. I, where the food is great, but the kids aren't eating it, or the food is meh, and the kids are are, you know, I mean, it just, it just depends. If the people who are in the school are interested in producing food that the kids will eat, the kids will be eating the food and will be really happy about it. As for the economics of it, the, there is so much money spent on trying to keep those meals away from kids and make sure that there's no fr fraud and that kids who are not eligible for free and reduced price meals don't get it. That if you got rid of that whole layer of bureaucracy, uh, you would have enough money uh, to feed kids. And, and there's and the program's not support. There isn't enough money in the program. Uh, the money should be going to the food and to the workers who are working there. Those workers need to be paid well too. Um, I mean, the system needs an overhaul, but I think universal school meals that absolutely makes sense, and it makes economic sense. Um. Are there some organizations, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped over a question. Uh, in general, what is your opinion about the food box compared to SNAP, especially in relation to obesity among um, uh, racial minorities? Well, I think people should be able to choose the foods that they're eating. Um, doesn't matter what their race is. Uh, the boxes are there. The boxes are what they are. There'll be dairy products in one and meat in another and vegetables in a third. And I don't know whether individuals get all three of them or how it works. Um, it depends on the food bank that's giving it out. But that's not what I, I think SNAP is a much better program. It gives people choices. Um, you know, there's very, very little that they can't buy on SNAP, and there have been efforts made to try to put in um, you know, that they can't buy sodas with it, but the Department of Agriculture has always said that you can't do that. 
Right. So, um, I, I mean, I, I think the problem with SNAP is that there's not enough money in it. You know, it doesn't go far enough. It's not, um, there's not enough, you know, it, it runs out. Um, but I'm a universal basic, basic income kind of person <laughs> too. So, um, I think we need something. We need to be thinking about those kinds of things. Yeah. Where do you see the biggest opportunities, Madeline wants to know, uh, for nonprofits to impact the root causes of our inequitable food systems? Oh, lobby. How about joining with other organizations and starting to deal with your congressional representatives? Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I think these groups are doing fantastic work. Um, the nonprofits that are working in the food area, but I wish that they would get more political. I, w I wish that they would go. I mean, I know that the day to day demands on them are so enormous, but they need to start taking on the political system and exercising um, and trying to get some political power or the system will never change. And Tara, among, uh, um, Tara wants to know what organizations are doing the most exciting work in this field? Who should we be following or who should other organizations look to as models? Oh, dear. <laughs> um, Is this a minefield for you? Uh, it's a minefield. <clears throat> and also, I just don't know. I know the big ones. Um, <clears throat> and the, uh, <clears throat> but the, excuse me. But there are so many organizations that are doing this kind of work, it's hard to single them out. <clears throat> what I suggest is that people just type in food advocacy and the location where you are and see what pops up. And Food Tank, um, the organization, Food Tank publishes lists of organizations doing all kinds of different kinds of work. And you can go on their website and see who they are. Um, but, you know, the organizations that have been around for a long time are doing good work. The food banks are doing good work. Everybody's doing good work. I just wish they would get together and form big coalitions um, and send delegations to Washington. Uh, Tara got in one more question under the wire. Any thoughts on nutrition incentive programs, Finney or GUSNIP? I don't know what those things are and how they could be more sustainable. Oh, I don't think I know what those are. Can you say again what they are? F-I-N-I and then slash G-U-S, capital G-U-S, capital N-I-P. Tara, oh, you I might have to explain to us what you're talking about. I don't know what those are. Sorry. Yeah, she characterizes them as nutrition incentive programs. So Tara, yeah, come I back with one more question to clarify. Christina asks, is there a way for our food system to still provide the diversity excuse me, in produce, spices, seafood, et cetera, without being as globalized and capitalist as it is? Would a regenerative food system allow for, say, obtaining crops native to Indonesia? In Indonesia, sure, why not? <laughs> you know, why not? Um, the, uh, the whole point about regenerative agriculture is you use what you've got. You know, you graze your animals on the kinds of grasses that grow <laughs> in your area, you raise the kinds of foods that are appropriate to your climate. What climate change is going to do to that? I don't know. It's not going to be good. It's certainly going to change things. But I think, you know, if you if you look at a food system from a big picture perspective, you want one that is appropriate for the climate that you're in, the culture that you're in, everything else that you're in. I mean, this seems very idealistic. Um, but if you don't have, um, you know, if you don't have idealistic goals, you don't know what to advocate for. So I'm in favor of idealistic goals. Tara has clarified her last question. Thank you, Tara. Uh, uh, that she's referring to incentive programs such as Double Up Food Bucks. Ah. Where SNAP participants receive extra dollars when purchasing mm -hmm. foods, fruits and vegetables, sometimes locally grown. Yeah, they're great, but they're minute. You know, they reach a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of um, SNAP recipients, for example, um, or even people who are shopping at farmer's markets. I mean, they're just tiny, tiny programs. The real problem is how you get them up to scale. 
um, and the and make them available to uh, many, many, many more people. But you know, we have a system in which the subsidies, the federal subsidies, go to corn and soybeans that are fed to animals. Or you know, my favorite statistic is that forty percent of United States corn goes to ethanol for cars. Forty percent. Um, you know, we're talking, we're not talking about sweet corn here. We're talking about field corn for animals. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, is that the kind of food system we want to have? Does that make sense? I don't think so. I don't think it makes sense. So if that's, and, you know, the farm bill, $20 billion, that's where that $20 billion goes every year. But the Trump administration added another 50. And believe me, it didn't go to fruit and vegetable growers, at least not very many of them. Uh, it went to corn and soybean producers. So the, um, yeah, I think we could change the system. I don't think the corn and soybean producers would like it, <laughs> but uh, you know, other people might. Uh, so nobody took the bait from me um, uh, regarding um, overly politicizing the end. So allow me to do it. I'm just sort of curious if there's anything, uh, say in the Biden-Harris platform as you've read it that gives you special excitement or anything that addresses any of the most pressing problems that they've proactively included in uh, any of their announced position papers or platform. Yeah, I actually am not that familiar with it. I mean, in, in part because um, I don't believe what anybody says before mm. an election. Before an election, fair enough. Yeah, um, and I want to wait and see. Um, the, to me, the really important issue with um, Biden Harris is who is advising them? Who are they likely to appoint into positions in the agencies that I care about? Um, the Department of Agriculture, the FDA, the CDC, the Environmental Protection Agency. I mean, these are agencies that I would like to see headed up by people who are really concerned about the problems that concern me the most, which are undernutrition, food insecurity, um, obesity, and the chronic diseases for which obesity raises risk, which affect a very large number of Americans and make them um, more sensitive to the bad effects of COVID and climate change, which is, uh, you know, the biggest problem facing humanity at the moment. And there's a lot we could do through food to address those problems. I want people in there who think those are important issues and want to do something about them. It occurs to me that a better way for me to frame my question would have been Mary Nessel, we just made you president of the United States. What would your first priorities be? So I think you've covered that ground yeah, for universal it. Universal basic income. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, fair enough. And universal yeah. basic income. So I don't, uh, want anybody, I don't want anybody to go hungry. Yeah. And that's what you've devoted your, your life's work to, to that fundamental premise that no one should go hungry. Uh, I want to thank you for being back with us, even even via you know remote. Especially, uh, I don't know if folks uh, have done the the, the math here, but um, you stayed up to ten thirty with us just to start this program. So thank you so much. And I just want to let every, remind everyone that what brought us together is uh, Marion Nessel's new book, um, uh, which is called "Let's Ask Marion: What You Need to Know About the Politics of Food, Nutrition, and Health." And uh, as I know I mentioned before, you can uh, pick up your copy tonight uh, using that buy the book button, that big glee, green glowing buy the book button at the center of your screen. It'll take you directly to the Third Place Books website. Mary Nessel, thank you so much for joining us and we will see you again, I hope in analog form uh, sometime. Let's hope. In, in perhaps a new administration. See you soon. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye everybody. <laughs>